get this shindig started. Uh, first off, do we have any announcements? But before we get to announcements, as you notice, there's no mic stands. We have mic runners. Hillary and uh, Michael, please stand up. If you have an announcement, flag one of these folks down, and they'll uh, tag you. The reason we want to do this is so it's on the audio tape. So it's not just in this room, but on the internet. So announcements. Hello, er oh, hello everyone. Uh, <laughs> Lyrics versus. Um, one thing I really wanted to uh, get across is: Is there anyone in here that does press kits? If there's anyone that does press kits, come holler at me. That's it. Um, this Wednesday at six thirty. You know it's early, but if you've got nothing to do on Wednesday and you're a fan of the Ataris. Chris Rowe, their frontman, is going to be doing a really intimate request-based show at Hay Cafe, which is in the corner of Magazine and Napoleon. And I will be playing, my name is Dominique Lejeune, acoustic, and the Lollies will be playing acoustic. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. You heard me. Uh, and it starts at 7, but the, sh the door is at 6.30. It's going to be a really, really cool experience for in the Ataris. They were on that, like, Now 14 CD. Big deal. Big deal. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Josh. Um, three announcements, actually. Um, one is concerning Vital Sounds. Um, they have decided to get a little more intricate with the music community, and they are looking for bands who would possibly like to play in Satchmos, and they can actually set that up for you for free and put flyers around campus for you. If you want to just do like an opening showcase kind of thing, you can make it free. You can charge it at no cost. So they're just looking to get more interactive with that. Second, um, I'm playing a show at Dragon's Den this Sunday, 10 o'clock, with four other hip-hop acts. So if you'd like to come out, it'd be really fun. It's only $4, not even 5 4 Ooh. And third announcement is that I am setting up a giant lyrical hip-hop fest, um, possibly at Tipitina's, maybe another venue, um, in April. So I'm looking for more hip-hop artists and spoken word, and we're going to call it Lyricon kind of like Comic-Con, where like comic book nerds come together and like share ideas and network, but this is for more like lyrical hip-hop artists, whatnot. Um, so yeah, look out for that. And come talk to me if you're looking for the Vital Sound Showcase or if you're a hip-hop or spoken word artist, because that would be great if you could come along. Thank you. Is it? It is? Okay. It's not? Okay. Sweet. Um, I got two announcements, both of them a little scattered with the information, so I'm going to try to get through this right now. Um, the 11th, this Friday, uh, Sun Hotel, my band's going to be playing at The Den, and we're playing with Matt Peoples Collective, uh, Royal Teeth, and Habitat. And Habitat is uh, Jack from Newgrass, and Evan and uh, Andrew from High One Eye. It's going to be sweet. Um, and that's a Valentine's Day show, so there'll be lots of love in the air. Um, and then... Two weeks from now, I think it's the 19th on Saturday, we're doing this big uh, like party festival thing, and it's for our friends. All, all the dudes in Newgrass got a bunch of stuff stolen from them this weekend. Um, our car got, they were borrowing our vehicle, and it got broken into, stole a bunch of their stuff. So we're going to raise a bunch of money for them, hopefully get them back on their feet. But there'll be more details about that later, so stay tuned. Sleep EP is now online, thanks to any of you that came to the show. It's on SoundCloud and Bandcamp. And it'll be on my MySpace before I go to sleep tonight, so check it out. Hey, uh, my name is Ty Billion. I'm putting out a video tonight on YouTube.com slash Ty Billion TV. And that's it. Is that it? All right, well, since I have the microphone and I'm up front, I'll give my announcement. My band, Mississippi Rail Company, is having a costume ball this Friday at the Blue Nile. A uh, $75 cash prize just for coming in a costume, and uh, there'll be a bunch of zombies there. So check that out on our website, MississippiRailCompany.com. Well, let's get down to business. Uh, we have a very special guest for this forum. He has been known to play bass in such wonderful bands as Agent Orange. 
He's currently a music publicist slash music manager doing his own thing for Octopus Entertainment. He's got quite an extensive career in the industry, but don't take my word for it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Levesque and Zach Lund. Seth. Are we on? Cool. Um, so I'd like to welcome music industry veteran and international man of publicity, James Levesque. Um, I've I wrote over, that, by the way. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote that and wanted me to say it. Sounds nice. <laughs> I've, over the past couple of weeks, had great conversation with James, and I've been really excited to get him here to talk to you guys because he has an immense amount of experience in multiple facets of the industry, and he's just got some damn good stories as well. So. Uh, uh, I just want to get it start off first tell them how you got into the music industry in the first place. Well, I, when I was 15 years old, I w became very excited um, about the new music that I was seeing. Uh, actually, a, a record, my brother worked at a record store, and he brought home uh, an album by the New York Dolls. And uh, everyone know who the New York Dolls are? They, um, to me, probably um, change music more than any other band. They're probably the, the godfathers of punk and, and uh, metal, hairspray, glam music. Um, and the, the record kind of intrigued me. I was afraid of uh, it in one way because the album cover was a bunch of guys dressed up like uh, you know, hookers on the streets <laughs> in uh, New York. But I listened to it, and, uh, and it kind of changed my perspective of music. And, um, and my friends and I um, were all in art class together in high school, and we decided to start a band, which became Agent Orange. Um, we were surfers, skateboarders, and um, we were a three-piece band only because we didn't have a lead singer, and we played surf instrumentals just because we didn't have a lead singer. And we kind of developed what's been known today as um, surf punk. That we're, we're considered the originators of surf punk. I don't know too many other bands that are surf punk but <laughs> that we originated, but uh, some of the artists who um, claim Agent Orange as some of their uh, influences are bands like um, Green Day, Nirvana. Uh, just the other day I was talking to Chris from the Foo Fighters. He was a big Agent Orange fan and told me, so it, it's amazing, bad religion. There's a lot of bands, no doubt. So it's kind of interesting how what we created created you know, right. it's almost uh, like you don't know when you're creating history or changing history, you don't really know it when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. it you know, at the time we just, we were just, I was a 15 year old kid. We started playing clubs like the Whiskey and selling them out when I was 15 years old, 16. <laughs> Had uh, songs on the radio. And I was lucky because we were at a very exciting time in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, because there was a scene. Right. Everybody wanted to get involved with it, it was exciting. And people went to shows. If it was a punk show, everyone showed up regardless of who was playing because it was all new anyways. Yeah. So I was at 15 years old headlining, making good money uh, as a 15, 16 year old. That's nice. um, the other side of that, at the same time I, I was involved with Agent Orange, I was the quarterback of the football team. So I had to make a decision of whether I wanted to go out and play football or choose music, and I chose music. And you know, the, the coaches weren't too happy about that. Yeah. but. <laughs> Um, uh, so that's basically how I got into the, the business. My brother, um, we uh, saw what we were doing. He said, hey, why don't I manage you guys? And uh, my brother is also, he's the president of a, a company called Luck Media and Marketing in Beverly Hills, New York, Las Vegas, Nashville. And um, he's a very successful public music publicist, but he started as the manager of Agent Orange. Hmm. When we would go into meetings at uh, Capitol Records when we got our, our second record deal, um, the people at the uh, record level say, you know what, we haven't even done anything yet, and you guys have already um, got advance orders of 250,000 copies. What's, what are you doing? And my brother and I told them, you know, we have New York Times did an article, you right. know, uh, we have a skateboard deal with Vision Sports, making Agent Orange skateboards, all these things, we're doing videos with skateboard companies, and they were really impressed with what we were doing. So I got a taste of the business, but I was also the bass player, but I was also really involved. My brother and I kind of crafted the career of, of the band right. early on. Yeah. So what about uh, like memories, Just touring, any really great memories? Well, I've been lucky 80s, to right? share the, the stage with a lot of great bands. Uh, we toured with the Ramones, and I was with the Ramones backstage at a time when 
all their leather jackets were stolen. And um, that happens, <laughs> but you have to understand these guys had had those leather jackets from early 70s, all worked in and everything. It was like someone had killed their, their dog. Oh, they, oh, oh, wow. they were so upset. And then for the rest of the tour, they made all the promoters um, had to have, a, they, had a, uh, they bought new uh, uh, leather jackets and they were all stiff and shiny and they looked so sad in them <laughs> because oh, it was like they had lost a best friend or something. And um, that was kind of an interesting uh, tour. After that, they, they made the promoters uh, uh, watch their, their leather jackets with security, had to watch them when they, we were not wearing them. Uh, 24 hours a day, I guess. So that was kind of an interesting but, uh, thing. On tour with the Ramones, you had to see like riots, or I mean, you had to have seen some cool. The biggest riot we played at the um, LA street scene in Los Angeles. They don't have it anymore because of, of the. I think we played the last show. We were. Right. The, it was Agent Orange was going to open the show. Uh, Poison was going to play second, and the Ramones were going to play at night. And there was about 100,000 people there. We started playing one song. We opened the set, and the and the audience went so crazy. They started pushing over like TV trucks and, and things. Uh, it turned into this huge, you know, mass of people moving, and and so they, the police moved in on horses and started beating the people over the head with clubs. Because in those days, you could still beat <laughs> you could still beat people with a club in those days. Uh, <laughs> and, days. Uh, and we played one song, and that was it. So the Ramones and Poison didn't get to play that night. But that's just one of many, uh, you know, cool, nice. crazy one, you know. Right. Half of a song, and then you got the plug pulled on you. We still got paid nicely, so. And how old are you during this? You're. Seven? I was probably 17 or 18 years yeah. old. That is nice. Yeah. So yeah, well, one night, uh, just on the age issue, uh, one night we played at the Whiskey A Go Go, and we sold out uh, Friday and Saturday nights, two shows a night. And uh, when I was, I think I was 16, 17 years old, and the promoter was this mafia kind of guy. Came backstage and said, "Hey, congratulations, you guys." Uh, sold b out both nights, and he gave us a, a big bottle of Magnum of champagne, and he handed it to us, and he looked at us, and how old are you guys? <laughs> We're all six, 17, and he took it back and said, sorry, I can't give it to you. Oh, man. But, That's rough. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah. What about, like, transition? So, okay, you toured and played with Agent Orange for how many years? Eight years? I was in the band from 1979 to 1988. Okay, so what made you leave, and then how did you segue from that into where you're at in the industry that's now? A, that's a great question. Um, actually, at the time that I made my decision to, um, it, the, we were doing really well as far as moving up the, you know, playing large clubs, touring the whole United States, uh, Europe and Canada and Hawaii and South America, uh, and we kind of plateaued. And what was happening was uh, kind of the transition towards the grunge uh, thing was starting to happen and starting right. to uh, percolate. And also, I had had my first child at that time. Um, and um, I really liked the music business part of it as well. And we kind of just took like a, um, a hiatus. It wasn't like we broke up or anything. We were just a three-piece band. And um, we were doing really well. We had a record deal with Capitol Records. We were, our songs were being used in movies and television, skateboard videos, and... Um, uh, good money. Yeah, that, that's, that's very good money. That's something that... Uh, the band couldn't survive without, right. especially nowadays. Uh, the in income streams are very, when you, it's, it's not from, you know, uh, actual record sales. It's right. touring, publishing, those are the things, endorsements, those are the things that generate money for bands nowadays. But um, did I answer your question? How, yeah. Why did I um, get out of it? Yeah, so why did you get out of it, and then just how did you segue into where you are now? Well, I started um, uh, getting in, in to the business side of things, and I was um, working with um, uh, other artists, developing artists, uh, writing songs for other artists. And um, the guitar player, uh, Mike Palm, he decided to go on and, and uh, put the band back together, and I wasn't interested in, in it at the time. And so and me and the original drummer, were, after 10 years of touring, we kind of, we were kind of done. And right. I never knew that the band would uh, be uh, still relevant after 30 years and still mm -hmm. sell records. Uh, you know, I, I'm a BMI affiliated songwriter. I have a publishing deal with EMI. I have a record deal with Warner Strategic Music. At 30 years, I still get. Um, so have you written a lot of songs for other people, or? I have, but nothing that ever hit. I mean, I, I wrote a song. Probably the biggest song that I wrote was called Everything Turns Gray for Agent Orange. I don't know if anyone knows that one. Um, it's been used in a lot of movies and things, and uh, it's kind of a, they use it on all the time on like Jackass and the Dudesons and uh, Wild Boys. Yeah. We get a lot of play from that, and that generates, 
It's amazing how one song in one TV show can generate so much money for my performing rights, BMI, right. uh, because it's shown all over the world over and over and over, and it just adds up. It's and it's really, it's really good money. Just one song. Consistent my from my thing that, that I always um, comment on is I wish I wrote more songs <laughs> because right. I have my catalog of, is limited. I share in all of the publishing for all Agent Orange songs, but I wish personally I would have wrote more songs. It seems like songwriting is the way to go if yes. you want to make the big. That's why uh, Pete Townsend lives in a castle and the other guys live in flats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so now you're a publicist mm -hmm. and you have your own company, mm -hmm. Octopus Entertainment. You mm -hmm. want to tell us a little about, I mean, the theory behind Octopus Entertainment and why you started it? First of all, I think that the octopus, the animal, if you want to call it that, is an amazing animal. And I, I use it as my icon for my company because it kind of represents the head or the mantle of the octopus. It's kind of my years of experience, my contacts, and then the tentacles are kind of all the different areas that I can help my clients with. I can basically help them create a virtual record label. I can help them with radio promotion. I know the people that plug in, the same ones that the record companies are using. I, I do the publicity and I help with the marketing. Uh, I can help them with, with touring. And um, so the tentacles are kind of all the other places I reach out and help. And because publicity, I found out just being a, um, in the movie industry it's different, but in the music industry, you have to help the artist create activity. You know, not just playing shows isn't enough anymore. So I'm always out there trying to create, come up with creative ideas right. to get them noticed or, um, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, just, it's much more than just sending out press releases hoping someone's going to uh, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> answer. Hit and miss. So I mean, I mean, I know you've worked, just talking to you, we've, you've told me a lot of them. Could you, ex you know, explain some of the artists you've worked with and help build their careers? Yeah. First of all, I want to uh, mention that um, my brother's firm, who I worked with for, for many years, uh, Luck Media, specialize in working with up and coming artists. There's a lot of big publicity firms out there like Rogers and Cowan and, and the big ones in Beverly Hills. They work with a lot of established artists. They send out okay. press releases and everybody calls and wants them. And then it's just a matter of uh, you know, going through it and picking and choosing who you want to do interviews for. In my case, I love taking a new artist. For example, we broke Kenny Chesney. Kenny Chesney was just an up and coming country artist. Um, and we helped develop him and helped him get his record deal with Sony, and it moved on. Uh, you know, he's the biggest, probably the biggest star on the planet right now, right. or one of them in the country world, especially, of course. But um, uh, Kenny Chesney um, and the, uh, uh, Sarah Evans, uh, Craig Morgan was just an independent artist when he came to us. I don't know if you people know Craig Morgan, country music. Um, we've worked with Lori Morgan, uh, Dina Carter. Uh, up-and-coming artists. We, uh, then we work with a lot of classic artists who want to you know, continue their career. Uh, probably the longest client that we had was Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> and um, yeah, nice, nicest guy on the planet. When, when we worked with him, uh, his uh, first paycheck he got from, uh, from his um, achy breaky heart, he was living in his car it was a 1980-something Chevy Corsica maroon with one hubcap on it, probably, <laughs> at the time. He was living in his car. He had two women, his wife included, were pregnant. And uh -huh. he got his first check for $15 million. <laughs> so he was in his, living in his car, <laughs> and he got a, his first check for $15 million. Now, he didn't write that song. If he would have wrote that song, his, that check would be easily over $50 million at the time. Yeah. I mean, or at least the publishing side of it. Mm -hmm. That's how big that song was. And you know, people uh, make jokes of it, but he about it. But it made his career, and he's had a very long career. His, his records continually to sell. His fans love him and buy everything that he that he puts out, gospel, all kind of things. Right. Yeah. So you've known him for a long time, and that carried over to knowing Miley. Am I correct? Uh, when I first met her, I knew her as Destiny Hope Cyrus, which is her real name. Really, yeah. and uh, she uh, we she mentioned that she wanted to um, play guitar, and I represented a a company called Daisy Rock Girl Guitars. Anyone know that company? Daisy Rock. <laughs> Daisy Rock was just a little tiny company when I started working with them, and most record dealers didn't or uh, music dealers didn't even think that there was a market for girl guitars. You know, they're smaller. 
the fretboard is, is thinner, they're lighter, they're pink and daisy colors. And uh, anyways, I, I got a um, guitar for Miley. I said, I'll get you one, but I want to take a picture of it you, with you and your dad on the red carpet at, at um, the ACM Awards in Vegas or something like that. I can't remember now. So we took a picture of her. We sent out a photo caption to all, of, all the country western or country uh, music magazines and, and uh, People Magazine and Country People. And it ran a lot of places. And we got a phone call. And someone on the phone said, um, does Miley sing? And I said, uh, yes, yeah, she does. Uh, she, she has interest in music. And they're all, well, we'd like her to come try out for this new show. And it's, at, it's for Disney. So uh, my brother called Billy Ray Su Billy and said, hey, um, uh, the, Disney has interest in having Miley come in and try out for this part for this uh, new TV show. And in my mind, I was thinking that's probably just a big cattle call or just calling everyone. They're trying to find someone, whatever. Right. And, but I also knew that Miley is, has probably one of the best personalities in, as far as being a performer. She has no fear of anything. And so she, um, Billy said, well, I'll send her on a plane and you take her. And we don't have time right now or whatever. And you take her to the audition. So we took her. Actually, I, I was too busy. So actually, uh, my brother's sister-in-law, or I mean, my brother's wife, my sister-in-law, took her to the audition. And they loved her. And they wanted her to come back. And so this time, Billy's all, really? <laughs> Okay, so he uh, this time he came back with her, and they said, "Why don't you try running some lines with Miley?" And um, by the way, did, does anyone know why her name is Miley? How she got that name? Her, because her her nickname, her dad called her Smiley, <laughs> and it turned into Miley, and it just stuck. And now she actually changed her name legally to to Miley, to Miley Cyrus. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, wow. anyways, the dad, Billy came read the lines, and he they loved him, and then they got the part. Mm -hmm. And uh, you yeah. know. And so that's how uh, it all came about. And then, of course, um, us being a boutique PR firm, and Billy had been with uh, Luck Media probably eight years at, at that time. Um, when Disney uh, put them under contract, we got fired because Disney is very controlling, and they want to do all the PR, and they want to do it their way. And so it's like we helped create something, which is fine. Same thing with Kenny Chesney. He got a big record deal. He goes with the publicist at the record label. So once they really hit that, you kind of disconnect from them? Well, uh, that's usually how it works. Uh, you know, the loyalty is uh, you know, only so far in, in the music business. <laughs> you know, business is business. Yeah. I understand it, but I enjoy the, the building up artists. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to be the guy just taking you know, uh, phone calls and picking and choosing who, who right. gets the media opportunities. Mm -hmm. I like to, to see it grow. OK, so you've got your business. Um, what is your, I mean, you know, what is your like spot in the industry in LA? You know, like um, my niche. Yeah, your niche. Well, uh, kind of what I said. I um, I like the um, having a small boutique operation um, that I can work on what projects I want to work on. Actually, I'm here uh, because of an association. Was I, I got interested in a, uh, a benefit concert that's coming up uh, that has been changing and growing and morphing. Uh, uh, to help the uh, St. Bernard Parish. And it was something, I'm a, I'm a fisherman, I'm a surfer. I always, when I saw what happened with the, the Gulf spill and Katrina, I thought, what if that happened to Southern California? Who would help us? Right. And so I lent my um, expertise to try to help and get artists and things. And, and it's an ongoing thing that we'll eventually going to have a nice big festival at the, at the end of uh, all of our hard work. And um, so that allows me to do stuff like this, to come here. I don't have a whole bunch of. Uh, of employees that I have to watch over, and I do what I want and work on what I want. Oh. And I can travel, and, yeah. So you don't have any, do you have any employees? How many yeah, employees? I have, you? I have three other employees three. and, okay, and cool. interns, and it all depends. Okay. I ramp up as bigger things come along. Right, I see. You know. OK, so for all these guys out here, because we've got people wanting to go into you know, every area of the business, artists, you know, future managers, all of that. Like, what about the condition of the industry, and you know, what are your recommendations for them, mm -hmm. you know, from your experience? Just well, um, one of the things I um, I t uh, talk about to clients or or potential clients in meetings uh, of artists who are trying to, you know, they've been working uh, their certain style of music for a certain amount of time and and, and haven't really got anywhere. Um, do we have any fans of uh, of the Seinfeld show out here? 
I tell you, I get more philosophy from that show. And one of them <laughs> that I take and I've given to my clients and it's worked is there was an episode where George, everything in his life has always gone wrong. Every decision he's made has always been the wrong. So Jerry said to him, well, why don't you do the exact opposite of one of your first <laughs> ideas? Mm -hmm. and, uh, he and George started doing that, and all of a sudden his life changed. And so a lot of artists, you know, they have a certain style of music they're, they're, they're doing, um, and they keep working and working, but they're not really getting anywhere. They're just kind of hovering. I say, you know what? That's not working. Maybe it's time to reintroduce yourself as a new, and reinvent yourself. A great example of that is Madonna. Madonna has reinvented herself how many times now over the years? And she's been successful. But she doesn't just stay in one thing. And um, she's constantly changing. Yeah, she's constantly changing. The, the music business, as I see it now, um, uh, there's more avenues for, to make money. The record companies are now in this idea where they're going to, because they're not selling CDs and all the CD shops are gone, the Tower Records and FYE is closing, they're all gone. There's not going to be no more CD. The CD is dead. But those mechanical record sales now, of course, are translating into iTunes downloads. But I don't know how many people know that iTunes takes 40% of that, of that price. It doesn't yeah. leave a whole lot for the artist. Yeah, a lot of us <laughs> that have our songs on iTunes know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so you have to look for other opportunities and other avenues and venue or revenue streams, mm -hmm. like, you know, especially in, in movie, television. Um, I've had many songs in um, video games, like uh, anyone have Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4? Uh, had a song in there called Bloodstains. Anyone know that song? Um, those are great opportunities. Those, those actually, those games sell more than CDs. Kids hear my, my songs on those video games over and over more than they would hear if they listened right, to it they, on a CD. It's more exposure, you know? And, um, good yeah, and there's also a new, I just had a song in, a, in a, a new game on EA Sports called Skate, another, just S-K-A-T-E. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Hoffman's BMX, what's his name? Matt Hoffman's BMX. Uh, luckily our music um, fit with that genre of, you know, extreme sports, so, right. so we were lucky in that in that area. Same thing with the, uh, you know, Steve-O and Jackass and all that stuff. They love that music and it fits with their, mm -hmm. with their shows. So, been lucky in that were respect. You, you in the, was it, did you have a song in the Jackass movies? Uh, I actually, um, I, we, I think we had one song in, in one of the Jackass movies. They wanted to use a, one, I just got a, a note from the publisher, they wanted to use our version of Pipeline for the new, the newest one they're doing right now that's going to be in 3D or something. Or did 3D? it already come out? Uh. I, th I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> it got turned down. They, they were going to use it, and for some reason, they went with something else. But so I don't think it. We I think we had one song that I remember in one of the Jackass movies. Okay, so I kind of want to just get to some stories now because you've okay. told me some pretty good ones. Um, in your, because I know you've, tell us about how you've worked with um, High Times. <laughs> oh, High Times. <laughs> well. First of all, um, I've, uh, for some reason, I have um, a reputation for being able to take porn stars and help them get mainstream media. And I did it a couple of, with a couple of people. Anyone know Tara Patrick? Yeah. All the guys. <laughs> um, anyone heard of Mary Carey for governor? She ran for governor. That was my that was my brainstorm. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, Tara Patrick uh, wanted to be on the cover of High Times Magazine because Jenna Jameson had been on it and she had the highest selling issue of High Times Magazine. So Tara Patrick wanted, wanted that and also I was helping her, uh, she was trying to get more mainstream. Uh, like Jenna Jameson kind of was like a chrysalis of a butterfly. She kind of like got away from the porn you know, thing for a while there. Uh, she's kind of disappeared now, but she was being on the red carpets at big events, you know, before porn stars were not invited to red carpets, right. you know, so uh, she became very accept accepted, and so Tara Patrick wanted that as well, and so um, High Times, uh, we, we went to the, the, the shoot in Las Vegas at the Palms, and High Times must have brought so much weed that I felt like so, like I was going to go to jail for forever. Because it was it was piled high, and uh, 
And uh, Terry Patrick was her cover shot on. Did anyone see the Terry Patrick cover on High Times? Where she kind of pulled this all into her chest and big pile and everything. And uh, the whole, the shoot was just complete. I don't know how they even got anything done because the whole top floor of, of the Palms Hotel was completely filled with smoke. And uh, no one got anything done. It was a big party and everything, but um, <laughs> it was, uh, but somehow I, I, I kind of stopped working with uh, the porn stars that want to make uh, the transition. First of all, they don't, there's rock star time, which means usually that means rock stars usually show up about an hour late for like important interviews and, and things. Uh, but porn stars show up about three hours late or they don't show up at all. And then that's my reputation at stake. I um, had a um, cover shoot for High Times again with a, a um, model named um, Alexis Winston. She was the, the most photographed uh, model for Penthouse Magazine. And um, she, High Times was coming, they came out to uh, Beverly Hills, they rented a mansion, they had wardrobe and they had makeup. And also I get a, uh, we're the day of the shoot, they're all ready for this uh, cover shoot. And um, Alexis decided that um, she didn't think she was gonna do it because her boyfriend is on the board of the California Highway Patrol and he didn't think it was a good idea that she was gonna be on the cover of High Times, but he has no problems with her spreading her appendages in Penthouse Magazine. <laughs> you know, so, but High Times, I, I don't know. I was just kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. He has plenty of these stories, it's awesome. Um, what, how much, what are we good, doing on time? Twenty minutes. Okay. So, is there other any other like advice? Um, oh, I, I think that if anything I wanted to mention uh, is um, in my time in the uh, music business and the entertainment industry, I found out where the power is. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out, but the power is with the agents. They are the ones. Do you, you ever go to a concert and you the, the, you have this headliner that you went to go see, and then you, you see these other two opening acts and go, how the heck did they get on the bill? Right. You know, it's because the the agent said, you want Nickelback, then you're going to have to take blah, blah, and blah, blah as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we were talking about that earlier. That's a whole other day of a subject up for me. That was just horrible, horrendous. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I was in like an alternate universe or something. <laughs> Just, I couldn't believe this was happening. And then Slash comes up. Oh, yeah. Sweet child. I don't even think it's, oh. I, don't even, I think it's a robot. I think they, they just put a robot, he's wearing the same hat, it's the same lead, he comes out of the, you know, it's, it's an animatronic Slash. <laughs> yeah. He got, he took his million dollars and went home. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyways, I just, that's the main thing. I just, the agents are the ones that hold the power. You don't, you don't do anything behind their backs. Uh, the, the artists, um, because these agents are their life stream of, of, of money, they treat the agents like gods and, and they're the ones that really hold the power in the music industry as far as uh, who gets to be crowned the next big, big artist. The most of them are usually lawyers, the big agents, like really? that William Morris agency, yeah. So a law degree is not a bad idea? For yeah, the music you want to be an agent, oh, absolutely, because that's all they deal with is contracts all day. Right. You know? it's, all, all about, and it's all about the money. And I'll tell you, working with them on uh, uh, causes, like I, I, I donate a lot of my time for the Wounded Warrior Project, and also I'm very interested in, uh, in the Gulf here, um, in the restoration of the, um, the wetlands and, and, and helping the fishermen. And, and, um, but the agents don't care. The artists don't care. They get, off, they get so many people coming to them, hey, you play this benefit, this, they don't care. They just, all, it's, to them, it's all about money. They don't, it's unless you can get to the artist. I'm not saying that all artists right. don't care, but they, the agents, they've heard it all a hundred times, you know. Mm -hmm. So you really have to, um, you know, pull their heartstrings and get them involved or have relationships. That's the other thing in the music business. It's who you know, it's uh, relationships, it's schmoozing, going to parties that you don't want to necessarily go to, but you need to go to because you're going to meet people. I mean, that, that's what it is. Just like me coming uh, here today was, you know, uh, through people that uh, I, I went out and uh, met people and uh, said, "Hey, we need your help," and, and so I, I, you know, it's who you who you know and, right. where, and where you expose yourself to, and get out there and see what you can, uh, you know, scrounge up for yourself, yeah. cool. and, and keep those relationships, uh, you know, 
don't burn any bridges. You know. okay. Yeah. All right. So, any questions for James? Uh, I, I was, I, Hey, I, how you doing? Uh, lyrics again. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask uh, to be a part of your 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 publish uh, publicist company or whatever. Uh, I said that wrong. Like, what status do you have to have? Is, is it a certain level of notoriety that you have to have to be a part of it, or what? That question was right here on my tip sheet for I Zach, and he it. didn't ask. He didn't ask. <laughs> That's a good question. There is a time. First of all, does everyone know what a publicist does? <laughs> Sometimes they call people will get publisher, publicist mixed up. They're two separate things. A publicist, um, you know, controls the image of an artist or celebrity, but also gets them on TV, in newspapers, magazines, and then it's even expanded beyond that. Um, when you're ready for a publicist, it's kind of like it's kind of um, similar to there's a time when you're ready for an agent. The agent is the is the missing piece for most performers. They're the ones the hardest to get uh, get their attention. For a publicist, helps you get that that attention of that agent. If you're performing on a regular basis, if people are lining up to come see you, if there's um, activity, um, and um, that's when a publicist can come in and, and help you. Um, it, um, you know, the activity is the most important thing. You have to have continually be doing things, whether you're, you're making a video and, and we send a photographer to take pictures of, of you during your video shoot or, or if you're in the recording studio and we take pictures in the recording studio and, and get it into the trade magazines or, you know, uh, people think sometimes a publicist, you have to wait till after the record's done, but not necessarily because there's lots of trade magazines, you know, Mix Magazine, Music Connection, there's lots of magazines you can get into that kind of... Uh, uh, I, that's how I like to start too, is uh, to do publicity in, in the industry magazines, in the recording industry magazines, that you're working with a certain producer and those things, because that gets a buzz going. And a lot of like Music Connection is a great example that all the agents read Music Connection to see who got fired or hired, <laughs> you know. And so those trade photos and stuff, it, it's a lot of people think you know, they can just uh, get a publicist and it's going to be a magic wand and you're going to get in, uh, you know, in the magazines and on MTV and things. It, it really doesn't work that way. Um, it, it's not a magic wand. You have to deserve to be there, but the publicist knows who to go to to take what you've created and to help spread the word. So you have to be uh, at a point where you're, you definitely have something. I, I'll tell a little story real quickly about when I knew that Agent Orange had something. We had been uh, touring up and down the, su the Southern California coast, but we, and, and up into Seattle and, and Portland, and um, we got a um, call from someone that wanted us to perform in Salt Lake City. And we're all, oh, is there a punk scene in, in Salt Lake City? We didn't know. But um, so we agreed to do the show. It was at the fairgrounds. And well, we did our sound check. And we, said, and we looked at this huge place and said, boy, I hope people show up at the show. And when, when it was showtime, we went out and walked on stage. And the place was packed. And all the kids knew all of our words. And they were going crazy. And we just looked at each, other, at each other and said, you know, we looked at each other and said, this is it. We have something here. There's something happening. This is in incredible. We had no idea there was a huge punk scene in, Seattle, in, in um, Salt Lake City. But that's when I knew that this was something that we should, uh, you know, try to expand. It was, that was my, uh, you know, light bulb over my head moment. Um, not all artists have that. And that's where I say if you continually do the same thing and get the same result, it's time to reinvent yourself and try something different. Not in, you know, you can't force something. People have to be, you know, just like anything, they have to be kind of led down the road to buying what you're selling. You know, did I answer your question? <laughs> any, any other questions? Have you ever pulled any magic to you stuff? Oh. Well, I, I, I can think of quite a few. One, one time, uh, actually this was my, um, uh, something my brother did. My brother um, was, uh, this is a good one, a good story. Uh, my brother was Michael Jackson's um, publicist for, uh, for uh, quite a few years, actually during the molestation, uh, first molestation uh, things, which is not a good job to have. Um, Michael Jackson, uh, my brother was watching TV 
uh, and uh, he saw in the news that um, there were allegations of molestation against Michael Jackson. And my brother called his boss, who was Lee Salters, and Lee Salters was the biggest publicist probably in Beverly Hills at the time. His clients were Frank Sinatra and Michael Jackson, uh, uh, Barbara Streisand, all, just all the biggest music entertainers. And um, so he called his boss and said, hey, we got a problem. And, my, and Michael Jackson was in Thailand at the time. And so my brother said, that, you know, we got to tell Michael not, not, not to uh, do anything right now. Um, don't make any comments or anything. But Michael insisted on um, going out onto a balcony and um, with a bunch of children in Thailand, wh which is known for child sex trade. <laughs> And to um, stand there with all these children and, and show that children love him, and that you know, and uh, some, of <laughs> some of my yeah, it was a big mistake. I don't know if anyone, you guys are probably too young to remember that uh, fiasco for Michael Jackson. But um, so another time, uh, Michael was to do a um, uh, press conference, and um, this is around that same time, and um, my brother had. Michael all of a sudden decided he wasn't going to do the press conference, and my brother had all these press from all over the world were there to hear what Michael had to say. So my brother sent out Bubbles the Chimp to do the, the uh, press conference. And so Michael's uh, Chimp sat up there and, and just acted like a monkey for about 10 minutes, and they snapped his pictures, and the pictures ran all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that, that's kind of a, a publicity stunt pulled out of your, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to think of some, I guess Mary Carey, I had her stand on the, uh, that ran for governor of California. She stood on the, the steps in a bikini, a red, white, and blue bikini, and that thing ran all over the world and uh, made her kind of a, um, f her 15 minutes of fame um, for running for governor. Her and, and uh, what was the, Gary Coleman ran for governor of California too. <laughs> yeah, didn't you say you had her on like Fox News and stuff? Like, oh yeah, she was on Fox News, on Hannity. She was on a lot of things. Everybody wanted her. She and she was very popular. All the red carpets wanted her. Um, that's another thing with red carpets. It's like, well, that's another story for another day. <laughs> Any other questions over here? We're good. What do you think of the? What do you think is the future for? Music publicist. Where do you see it going? What's the cutting edge right now? That's a great question because um, because of you know publicity never was the job of bands. They never really had to do that themselves, or it, it used to hire a publicist to handle uh, publicizing things. And uh, you know it used to be bands used to pass out flyers and things like that. But now because of the reach of of the social media. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. The same thing with the recording industry as well. The artists are taking that all on themselves now. Uh, so the, 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 I think that what we're seeing is a publicist, like I said, how my company has morphed. It's more than just doing publicity because that's a lot of it's being done by the artists themselves. And, and they're also having a, a very close connection with your fans. And when I was a kid, you couldn't get anywhere contact to the artists. They were, all they were were blurry pictures on an album cover. You know, but now you can actually you know sign up and like their sites and, and get see what they have to say, and that that right there is is one on one publicity. So I see the as far as the, the PR industry, it's it's changing and we're becoming more consultants on a, on a variety of many different areas, not just in, in the media. So so I would say it's definitely changing. Any more questions? Um, to work in this industry, do you think at any point you had to sort of set aside like values and ideals? I know you started off in Agent Orange playing shows with hormones and stuff. At some point did you have to say, now this is a business and now all I want to do is make money? And I'm sure you've made a lot of money and that's great. But did you kind of have to say, like separate maybe some kind of passion for music or entertainment and then just a business? Yeah. That, that I understand what you're saying. Um, I think uh, uh, music for me has changed dramatically through my whole life because when I was a kid, I listened to music as a whole. When I became a recording artist, I listened to it in pieces and I didn't enjoy it as much. I don't know, you guys, a lot of you guys are recording artists out here or, or in the recording process. 
you listen to it differently. Like as a bass player, you listen to the bass. You, you hear it in pieces. Um, and um, same thing with the, the you know, um, actually yeah, there's a line in one of our Agent Orange songs that says, unless we all decide to be a business, not a band. And it was kind of foretelling the future. Um, and when you're in the, when it becomes a business, like we didn't care about money or business when we first started. We just wanted to play music. And it was so exciting and, and fun. And uh, every day was, was something new. But uh, when you get into the business part of it, it, there are days when I don't, you know, I get 200 CDs a week, people sending, wanting me to listen to their music and, you know, telling, most of them are unlistenable. There's, uh, you know, if every one of them has a guy with an acoustic guitar leaning up against the brick wall or walking down, uh, you know, the railroad tracks, <laughs> you know. And um, a lot of those, uh, uh, I don't even listen to because uh, I have so much I have to listen to. I try to listen to my car as much as I can. But um, it's, I like being a musician and not have to worry about it, but because of who I am and, and my brother's involvement, I, I got really involved in the business part of it and, um, and I did enjoy it, but I really enjoy helping others now. I love working with creative people. I'm not creating anymore, but I love working with, so I, I can see it in people's eyes. And I'll tell you, the ones that make it are the ones that are driven. The artists that are driven, not the ones. There's, there's so many talented people out there. I, I get so many great CDs sometimes, and uh, it's just they don't, they're not driven, and they'll never make it. You have to be driven. It's not, there's not hoping that, that someone's going to find this CD and, and give you a call, like Fred Durst or called Puddle of Mud or something, you know. <laughs> but um, you have to be driven. And, but yeah, the, the, the business side of it um, has changed my love of music because it is a business, and I, I don't like seeing when I see businessmen getting their hands in on artists' money when it's something that belongs to them. And I'm a big proponent of, of not playing for, uh, for free, for pay to play, or any of those things. I, I, I'm very against that. And I, if you would like, right now, we should all get together and let's go protest somewhere. <laughs> because um, it doesn't make sense to me when people go to see a band and there's pay to play. Going, Does that happen in this, in this area? In LA, it's rampant where you, people, you know, like the Whiskey A Go Go now is, a, um, is basically a tourist attraction for bands. <laughs> they come in, they play, they get their, um, their DVD, and they go out the back door. And it's, it's not, you know, that's, to me, it's not what it's about, you know. And, but I, I, I just don't believe that um, a band should perform. Everyone comes to see them. They either paid to play or they, um, you know, had to sell tickets or whatever, but the bouncer gets paid. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the musicians don't get paid, yeah. or they had to pay to play. That's wrong. And anyone, if you allow that to go on, it's, it's going to go on. Yeah. If we don't make a stand, you know, it's, that's why people come, for the music. Not because they have a, a nice smelling club. Yeah. <laughs> More yeah. questions over here? Quiet over here. <laughs> Anybody? Maybe I'm um, done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you enjoy the sort of uh, conjunction of music and social protest, next week we're having Loyola's own Robert Bell come speak about pop music and protest and some of the aspects in some of his lectures. So uh, that's going to be exciting. And you have to come. So. <laughs> <laughs>